All right, thanks for joining. Today we're going to be talking about uh, performance testing for modern applications. Uh, I'm going to dive into some tools and techniques on how to test performance and capacity planning for the server side, but also how to understand performance in the browser on the client side. So again, my name's Dustin Whittle. You can find me at dustinwhittle.com or follow me on Twitter. Uh, all these slides are already available online on speakerdeck.com slash dustinwhittle. So I'd like to uh, talk about performance from the perspective of a business to get started. So why does performance matter? Why should you invest as, uh, in performance as a feature? So the most impressive statistic that I found is for every 100 milliseconds that Amazon.com shaves off of the end user experience, they increase their revenue by 1%. Uh, Mozilla shaved 2.2 seconds off their landing page experience and they increased downloads by 60 million for Firefox. So the reality is that performance directly impacts the bottom line. You should really think of performance as a feature. But the question becomes how fast is fast enough? It's not just enough to be available, uh, you actually need to be performance as well. The reality is that uh, the brain perceives page latency uh, quite quickly, so 0.1 seconds or 100 milliseconds, it seems instantaneous. It's like flipping a page in a book. You don't lose your context. One second, you can still think seamlessly, but you start to fall off after about one second. And it's proven that after 10 seconds, users will abandon your application. So we've probably all shared the same experience of being in a checkout, and you click the checkout button, and it just waits, and you don't know what's happening. Well, I think the engineer and all of us knows to just wait it out so you don't get charged again. So again, how fast is fast enough? Under 100 milliseconds is perceived as being instantaneous. 100 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds, the user is going to start to notice the delay. The delay becomes perceptible to the user. And about one second is the limit for keeping a user's uh, flow without breaking their attention span. And uh, these statistics come from Jacob Nielsen, infamous UX researcher, and then Akamai did a study as well on this. But the important one is after about three seconds, 40% of users will abandon your site. And in the mobile world, it's even worse because users will go on to write bad reviews and never return. But this is a different problem today than it was 10 years ago. In modern web applications, you spend more time in the browser than you do on the server side. So the 100 milliseconds you're waiting for the server side response is nothing compared to the two or three seconds you're waiting for the JavaScript and CSS to download to be evaluated by the browser, for the browser to paint the page, and for the page to become available to the user. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is the user's perceived latency. So I go through all of this so I can say treat performance as a feature. Now let's talk about how you can do that. So let's talk about some tools of the trade for performance and load testing. I like to start by understanding the baseline performance uh, we all use different frameworks out there, so I like to understand what does a static asset look like being served directly from Nginx? What does Hello World look like by serving directly from PHP? What does Hello World in your framework, maybe use Silex as a micro framework or use Symfony as a full stack framework? You want to understand the overhead that each one of these layers adds to your application. And then the reality is that the applications are quite complex. The home page might be highly cached, whereas the checkout transaction might actually talk to a payment processor, a shipping provider, anti-fraud service, so they have different performance characteristics. When it comes to testing your applications and capacity planning, you really want to understand the performance of your most common user scenarios, not just a single endpoint. So I'll start with a couple of tools that make it easy to test a single endpoint and then progress through uh, more complex user flows. So the first tool is Apache Bench. If you've ever installed Apache, you can app get install Apache 2 utils and you have access to the Apache Bench command. Apache Bench is extremely easy to just load test a single endpoint. If you just want to get an understanding of the average latency of your application and the request per seconds per server, you can very easily do this with Apache Bench. So a quick example. So you can run AB, Apache Bench, and then in this example, I'm just going to artificially limit the concurrency. So this just says Apache Bench dash C for concurrency. So one concurrent user or one concurrent HTTP request for 10 seconds against acmedemoapp.com. So this is a very simple load test. And what you see is that we get a very impressive 18 requests per second at an average time per request of 53 milliseconds. Now, this is not a real load test because we're artificially limit limiting this to one concurrent request, but the goal when you do performance testing is to start to see at which point the latency rises for each machine. You can always get additional requests from your applications at the cost of latency. So let's increase the concurrency a bit more. 
So again, Apache Bench, dash C for concurrency. Uh, this time we're going to limit it to 10 concurrent users and we have a timeout of 10 seconds. So I want to test 10 concurrent users or 10 HTTP requests for 10 seconds. Again, not a great real world load test, but a simple way to increase the concurrency to understand the performance trade off for the transactions per second. So here we now improve the request per second. We get 65 requests per second, uh, but the average latency for the request has gone up to 150 milliseconds. So again, we increase the level of concurrency, but now the latency starts to rise. When it comes to capacity planning and load testing, you want to understand how many servers do you need to uh, be, be able to survive your users, um, yet at the same time by providing an SLA of an ideal user experience. So if you want to strive for a 200 millisecond server response time, how many servers do you need to handle 100,000 concurrent requests serving at 200 milliseconds response time? This is why you slowly increase the level of concurrency to see where the latency rises. You can always just increase the level of concurrency until the machine fails, but again, your, all of your users will suffer. So Apache Bench makes it very easy to load test a single endpoint. Apache Bench is available on all, uh, all the different operating systems and it's pretty standard. But I actually prefer Siege. So Siege is a much easier tool, uh, it's much more flexible, uh, but it works very similar to Apache Bench. So we'll take the same load test we just ran on Apache Bench and we'll run it with Siege. So in this case, we have Siege, the same sort of uh, format, dash C for concurrency, so we have 10 concurrent HTTP requests, uh, and we have a time of 10 seconds. So in the real world, you want to run this for a very long period of time, you want to increase the level of concurrency to a real world usage, but for this quick example, I want to mirror what I ran earlier. So here we have roughly the same output, uh, 65 transactions a second, uh, with about 50 milliseconds latency. So Apache Bench and Siege, again, they make it very easy to load test a single endpoint, but what happens when you need more than one machine? By a show of hands, how many people run real applications behind a load balancer with many application servers? Right, so in the real world, you need to generate massive amounts of concurrency, more than you can generate off of a single laptop and a good internet connection. So how can you run distributed load tests or distributed denial of service attack if you want? So enter bees with machine guns which I just like talking about because this logo is amazing. But Bees with Machine Guns is really just a utility for arming many bees to attack targets. Or this means using creating EC2 instances to load test web applications. With the, the benefit of the cloud or Amazon Web Services is that costs scale linearly with demand. So if I quickly want to turn on 20 machines and generate a distributed load test, I can very easily turn on 20 machines, run a load test, and then turn them off and only pay for what I've used. Bees with Machine Guns makes it extremely easy to orchestrate. Bees with Machine Guns is a Python project, so it's easy to install. You can pip install Bees with Machine Guns. Uh, I know I'm talking at a forum PHP, but hopefully uh, you don't hate on Python too much. So with the pip install Bees with Machine Guns, the only thing that you need are an access key in secret so that you can access the Amazon Web Services UI. So uh, they provide a free account. If you've never used Amazon Web Services before, you can go to aws.amazon.com slash free and get your credentials today. But this is the only thing that needs to be configured. You give it an access key and an access secret, and then you can use the bees command. So bees with machine guns is really easy. You can simply call bees up and then dash s2, the number of servers that I want to turn on to run my load test. There's some more output here, like uh, the default security group in the US West 2B data center. So I want to run this on the west coast of the US, and I want to log in with this SSH key and this SSH user. Uh, but the only thing you really need to know is bees up dash S and the number of servers you want to turn on. Uh, these, it's bees with machine guns is written by the guys from the Chicago Tribune, and they're sort of hilarious with their output. So they're gonna connect to the hive, attempt to call up two bees, and it's gonna wait for the bees to load their machine guns. Once the bees are ready to attack, the swarm has assembled two bees. And then you can start to load test your application. So the reason that I'm talking about this is with Apache Bench and Siege, you can generate low amounts of concurrency because you can only run it off a single machine. So maybe your limit is 10,000 requests a second, but in the real world, you need to be able to load test more than this. So how do you set up a distributed load test? Well, that's where Bees with Machine comes in. They make it very easy to orchestrate many machines to attack a target. So we'll do that exactly now. So we'll call bees attack, dash n is the number of total requests we want to make, and dash c is the concurrency. So in this case, I just have 50 concurrent users. This is nothing that we didn't run earlier, but I can continue to increase this. 
and I give this a simple endpoint, acmedemoapp.com. So uh, we run the load test and we get our response back. So we completed 1,000 requests. Uh, each of the two Bs will fire 500 rounds, 25 at a time. And like uh, most frameworks that have some initialization or bootstrap, uh, they will sting the URL or make a single HTTP request so it'll prime the cache and then they'll discard it and then they'll load test so that you have a clean test. And what you'll see is we've increased because we have a concurrency of 50 now. We have 306 requests per second, but the average latency is 163 milliseconds. But we can keep increasing the level of concurrency until we hit our maximum. Now this is the only project that I know that says this is a felony in the US where I'm from to run against any site but your own because this is effectively a distributed denial of service attack, or could be. So you can keep increasing the level of concurrency. So we started with a concurrency of 50 and now we'll increase to 1,000. So we can call B's attack dash N, this time I want to run 100,000 requests, uh, 1,000 concurrently. And again, at a single URL, so acmedemoapp.com. So we'll read two Bs from the roster, connect to the hive, assemble the two Bs. Each of the two Bs will fire 50,000 rounds, 500 at a time, for a total of 1,000 concurrent requests. And this time we'll, we'll increase the level of concurrency, but we're also gonna increase the latency. So here we can see the request per second. We can sustain 502 requests per second, but now the average response time is 360 milliseconds. So when you're running load tests and you're trying to figure out how to do capacity planning, the goal is really that you slowly increase the level of concurrency until you hit your maximum SLA, uh, and then you can understand the number of servers that you need to sustain production load. And then you can optimize from this. Now again, the benefit of the cloud is it costs scale linearly with demand, so you can just turn on some machines temporarily, run a load test, and then you can call bees down, and then it'll turn off the machines. Uh, so basically this just shuts down the EC2 instances, and you're ready. So we talked about Apache Bench and Siege, simple ways to load test a single endpoint. And we talk about bees with machine guns, which is a simple way to load test a single endpoint what, with distributed machines. And now we'll talk about Locust.io. Locust.io makes it very easy, and this is my preferred tool for doing performance testing on the server side, and it's because it allows you to describe complex user scenarios, like I want to go to the home page, I want to go log in to the login endpoint, and then I want to keep the state of that request, and then make a post to the profile, and then I can understand the performance of this user scenario. Because again, the performance characteristics of each transaction are different. The home page is highly cached. The checkout transaction has many dependencies. When you're load testing your application, you really want to understand your most common user flows. So Locust.io makes it extremely easy to do. Again, this is a Python project. So you can find out more at Locust.io, or you can just get started with pip install Locust.io. Now the idea here is, like with all of these, you simply want to describe a common user scenario and then run the load test and evaluate the results. So I think this is readable, yes. Uh, so the idea is you describe a set of website tasks or user scenarios, uh, and then you can just create, just like you have a, uh, in a functional test, a setup and a teardown, you can have the same thing here. So when I start the functional test, I want to log in to the endpoint, uh, and uh, then you can describe a set of tasks. So in this case, I just want to go to the home page and then go to the about page. And I can run this at different levels of concurrency. Let's take a look at a different example. So this is a user behavior where I want to log in, I want to go to the home page, and then I want to go to my profile page. So here you can define different, as many behaviors as you want. This is called a locus file. You can describe as many of these as you want and run them concurrently. And now the benefit of Locust.io is it has not only a command line but also a web UI so that you can automate this. Uh, the reason I talk about uh, performance testing is I think most engineering teams, they don't do this. And they only do it when they're about to launch or after they've failed to launch. Uh, so usually you should try to make it part of the development life cycle. In the same way you run unit and functional tests, you should have some level of performance tests. Again, you should treat performance as a feature. So in this scenario, again, it's pretty straightforward. On start, I want to go call login. In this login, I just post to our login endpoint with the username and password. And then the first task, you can see the add task annotation for the profile, is I wanna just make a slash request to slash profile, and then I wanna request the home page. So I can build as many locus files as I want for as many user scenarios, and then run load test. Now, it also comes with this nice UI so that you can get to good reporting as well as an automated way to run load tests. But again, this makes it very easy to increase the level of concurrency because you can run many distributed tests by adding more slaves. 
So here is running six slaves. Uh, this comes directly off the Locust IO site, so I tried to keep the example simple so that you can follow up later. But the idea here is for each user task, uh, you have a new endpoint. You can see the number of total requests made, the number of failed requests, the median time response times, and then the requests per second. And then you can add more slaves to increase the requests per second, but at this case, we're running 9,000 concurrent users and we're getting an average of 76 requests per second. But it depends on the user scenario. So you can run this uh, for as complex of projects or very simple projects, it just depends what you need. Okay, so there are many tools. I'm only talking about a few here, just the most common use cases of load testing a single endpoint, uh, running a distributed load test with massive concurrency, and then running uh, complex user scenarios with also a high level of concurrency. Uh, pick whichever tool you prefer. Uh, the goal here is that you should add performance testing to part of the software development lifecycle. Uh, Gatling Work, Vega, Sung, they're all great tools. They all have different use cases. Pick which works for your stack. Okay, so this is the server side. Uh, the reality is that in modern web applications, again, more latency comes from the client side than the server side. So you should also understand client side performance. What's actually happening in the browser? The 100 milliseconds it takes for PHP to respond with some HTML or some JSON is nothing compared to the two or four seconds it takes for the browser to evaluate that and make the application available for the user. The only performance metric that really matters is the end user's perceived latency, how long they think it takes to use the application. So Google has invested heavily in performance engineering and they have a ton of tools to support this. One of the tools that they offer is Google PageSpeed Insights. Google PageSpeed Insights just allows you to analyze and optimize your websites for client-side performance, but they give common best practices. So it's available at developer.google.com slash pagespeed. Again, it's developer.google.com slash pagespeed. And they offer a couple of different experiences. One, they have a JSON API, so you can automate this as part of the continuous integration flow. Uh, two, they have a website where you can just put in the URL and then get some performance best practices. A uh, common performance best practice is to use far futures expire headers, HTTP caching, for all of your static assets. Another one is to move JavaScript to the bottom of the page, CSS to the top of the page. What they do is evaluate the browser and the content that's served and give you some practical recommendations on how to improve performance. It's not always easy to change the uh, build and deploy process. And it's not always easy to change the code. Sometimes you inherit applications. So uh, what do you do when you can't actually change this? Well, there's actually a web server extension for PageSpeed where you can uh, embed the PageSpeed module inside of Nginx or Apache, and it will rewrite the response at runtime to improve performance. So with zero code changes on the server side, you can uh, improve performance on the client side very easily. And then they also offer an NPM package that makes it easy to automate and test. So you can npm install PSI or PageSpeed Insights, and then you have access to the PSI command, which is pretty straightforward. It does everything the website does. The, this uses a JSON API. All of Google services have a JSON API underneath. All this does is provide a command line interface to this. The reason I mentioned some of these tools like uh, Locust.io, I'll talk about SiteSpeed in a minute, is that you should automate client-side performance testing with whatever you use to automate your front-end workflows. So if you're not using Grunt and Gulp or some equivalents, uh, you should be to automate the common tasks for building and deploying your project. Okay, by a show of hands, how many of you would call yourselves professionals? Really? That's it? Yeah, I think that's on. Anyways, so the idea here is that how many people understand how fast your site is in production? And then also by the same show of hands, how many of you find out about a problem because a user complains to support? Right, the reality is that most people don't do this testing, so they find out about the somebody can't check out because they contact support and it doesn't work. Then it finally eventually gets escalated to you. But this, your company's already lost money, the applications failed to work, the users have already suffered. Now the whole goal of performance testing is that you want to understand what breaks when you have massive amounts of concurrency or when you have real production traffic. So you should instrument everything. Before you run your load test, you should invest in instrumenting your infrastructure, your code, your databases, caches, queues, calls to third party services, because all of these things will affect performance. And if you're gonna run a load test with something like Locust.io and generate this amount of concurrency, uh, you really wanna be able to understand what breaks or what stresses the system. Where, you, where is it weak or not robust? 
So there's no shortage of monitoring tools. If you go to uh, the, hall, the expo hall, there's plenty of vendors here who are happy to sell you something. Uh, I work for one of these vendors, but the idea is not to use one of our products, but is to use whatever works for you. You should use some level of performance testing. So track performance in both development and production. Because again, when you're running these load tests, you really want to understand uh, in development before things break in production, how has the last build either improved or degraded performance? So there's a couple of tools that make this easy to automate. Uh, one is webpagetest.org. Webpagetest.org makes it extremely easy to test any web application from any web browser, from any location, over any network conditions. So if you just want to get a quick idea of what performance looks like in Opera running on Telstra's network in Sydney, Australia, you can very easily evaluate client-side performance. This is what the webpagetest.org looks like, and if you submit a URL, you can pick the browser, the connection type. One of the benefits is it'll give you a rendering of the, uh, the web page as well as a video of the rendering process, so you can also use it for QA. But the reason I like to point it out because it gives you detailed performance metrics and a performance report on the client side as well as the server side. So if you've ever used Chrome Developer Tools, you can see the water, uh, resource waterfall, uh, which you'll see here is basically how many of these. Uh, I have a very impressive website, dustinwhittle.com. It has my name and a bunch of links. And then I borrow this service from Google for the, all the fav icons for the websites. Each one of these uh, is a redirect that goes to the actual fav icon, which you see all the yellow lines is pointing out that I'm making an additional HTTP request. And if I'm using SSL, I'm doing SSL negotiation for each one of these domains and also a DNS lookup. So an easy way to improve performance is by removing this. Webpagetests.org makes this very easy to see. It also makes it very easy to see how your applications perform over poor network conditions. Not all of the world has a fast internet, so you really, if you serve a global audience, should understand what that performance looks like. So sitespeed.io is great because it allows you to uh, get a performance report that you can treat as a test artifact and build into your continuous integration flow. So this can run every time you do a new deploy. So sitespeed is a Node.js package, so you can npm install sitespeed.io. It's also the website, sitespeed.io. And the goal here is that it makes it very easy to get a holistic view of performance for your application. And not just a single page, like uh, Google PageSpeed Insights, but actually it'll test uh, all of the pages uh, of your application, all the publicly accessible pages. And when you run sitespeed.io and dash h, and then a domain, what you end up with is a report that looks like this. So you get a performance roll up for the entire application, and then you get performance metrics for uh, each individual page. But it gives you very detailed metrics, like how many HTTP requests are you making with no gzip compression? How many images are being scaled in the browser versus being served at an optimal size? How many are using uh, caching headers and Far Futures expires headers? When's the cache change, the number of DNS lookups, the number of time you're spending doing SSL negotiation, and then the front end performance time as well as the server first byte time. So it really gives you detailed and granular visibility into the performance on both the server side and the client side. Now there's no shortage of monitoring and APM tools. Um, most of these tools, the company I work for is called AppDynamics. All of these tools, the goal is to provide you visibility into what happens on the server side, but also what happens on the client side, and really granular visibility. There's a couple approaches you can take. You can take open source and glue the data together yourself. You may be familiar with tools like New Relic. Uh, there's AppDynamics, there's Dynatrace and Ruxit. There's a ton of these APM tools. What would I, I would suggest either rolling out your own instrumentation and your own monitoring or using one of these tools as a commercial solution before you start doing load testing. Sometimes it's easier to uh, buy than it is to build. Which is why I also mentioned some commercial load testing tools because for engineers it's pretty easy to build this stuff yourself but sometimes it's not worth it to the business to justify the engineering time. So with these tools you can do this in a half an hour. So Apica is a, is a great load testing tool if you need complex, uh, complex tests using many locations around the world or real browsers. Uh, Apica makes it very easy to roll this out. If you just need something quick and dirty, uh, Blitz.io makes it extremely easy to just load test a single endpoint with massive amounts of concurrency. And then if you need to test mobile applications on real devices or you really want to test um, a thousand real user sessions in real browsers, uh, BlazeMeter is a great solution as well. So sometimes it makes sense to build it on yourself, sometimes it's cost prohibitive or uh, the engineering time isn't worth it. Uh, so the, here's where you can use commercial tools. Okay, at some point in life you learn that the world is an imperfect place. 
And I think the best quote is, uh, software will eventually work and hardware will eventually fail, so you should test for your failures. Everything I talk about here is about testing for the success case, but in the real world, things break, a database goes down, uh, you get rate limited by a web third-party web service, things that are beyond your control. When you're load testing, one of the things you want to find out is how robust or resilient your application infrastructure is. So uh, Netflix has invested heavily in uh, some performance engineering tools. Uh, they run on Amazon Web Services. They released a suite of tools called the Simeon Army. One of these tools is uh, called Chaos Monkey. It'll go into your AWS environment and basically create chaos, uh, kill off network ports, kill off instances, introduce network latency, a, w a wide array of ways to introduce failures. So the goal here is to be able to simulate these failures while you're running load tests to see exactly how your application responds underneath. If you start to get rate limited by a third-party web service, do you exponentially back off and retry the request? Uh, does the queue build up? What exactly happens? So the idea here is what happens if you lose a caching layer and there's a sudden surge of traffic to the database? What happens if a third-party dependency slows down? These are the sort of failures you should introduce when you start to run load tests so you can understand how your applications can survive or not. It's better to learn early than to do it at production. Okay, just to recap some best practices, because this is a quick talk. Uh, treat performance as a feature. Again, it really does actually impact the application uh, and the user experience and ultimately the business. So you should invest in it in the same way you invest in functional tests. Capacity plan and load test the server side. You don't want to wait till launch day to figure out that you're not going to survive. You should make this part of the software development lifecycle. Optimize and performance test the client side. Again, you spend more time in the browser than you do on the server side, but when most people think about performance testing, they only think about can the PHP server survive. Understand your starting point. You can only measure the change if you know where you're starting from. So instrument everything. Instrument before you start to run these load tests. It doesn't matter whether you use commercial APM tools or you use open source monitoring tools. As long as you can understand what works and what breaks when you have high levels of load, you can start to derive useful insights from these tests. And that's the whole reason you want to run performance testing. So monitor performance and development in production. You want to make sure that you don't wait to just the production. Uh, a lot of performance problems can be caught early on in the dev lifecycle process. And then measure the difference of every change. It's not just code, out, uh, code deploys that cause performance changes. Upgrading a PHP version will improve performance. Um, upgrading the database, introducing a new third-party dependency will all affect performance. So you should think about it's the overall architecture, not just the specifics of your code. And measure the difference of every change. Again, it really matters. So automate performance testing in your build and deployment process, and then understand how failures impact performance. So this is all relatively solid advice for performance testing. Uh, hopefully this gives you a way to get started. All of these tools are available online for free. You can follow the slides at speakerdeck.com slash Dustin Whittle. Um, most of this advice makes sense for today in terms of the front end performance, but uh, the world is changing. The protocols are evolving. With the introduction of HTTP2, a lot of today's best practices are tomorrow's anti-patterns. So things like domain sharding, CSS concatenation, JavaScript concatenation, uh, all of these things will hurt you in the future. So you really need to understand what your audience looks like because in a year from now, this might be a very different landscape. So in the HTTP2 world, you unshard, you unconcatenate, you unsprite your assets because they handle concurrent connections much better. So if you're interested in this stuff, uh, there's a Google performance engineer called Ilya Grigoric who wrote a great book on high performance browser networking. Uh, you can get it for free at this URL. I'd highly recommend it if you're interested in performance. So just to recap, integrate automated performance testing into your continuous integration environment. All these tools can be integrated with Travis or Jenkins or whatever your flavor is. Understand the performance implications of every deployment and package upgrade and monitor the end user experience end to end in production. And that is all I have. I'd like to open it up for questions. I know I went really fast because there's a lot of content. Again, these slides are available at speakerdeck.com slash Dustin Whittle. There's a bunch of notes in the slides so that you can follow step by step on your own time. Um, if you have any questions or I could be of any help, please just reach out on Twitter. I'll be around for the next few days, so feel free to grab me. Otherwise, any questions? Let's not all ask at once. Yeah, I think we have time for at least one question. Uh, just raise your hand so that I can give you the microphone. Anyone? All right. I have one, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, you introduced some tools like um, the um, performance analysis on different layers of the application. 
Although you compare this tools uh, to um, Dapper from Google or Zipkin from Twitter, so this uh, trust, trusting framework, maybe? Yeah, so basically, so Zipkin uh, is a framework uh, from, t uh, from Twitter that basically supports a bunch of different languages, but is really built for Java. And the idea is when you have complex distributed application, the same thing with Dapper from Google. The goal of all of these tools is when you have a distributed application making many calls across the network, uh, most of these tools will only tell you about the first hop, so you can only see the first call made to the server side. But when you have uh, distributed services, it's really hard to trace the transactions between all the different tiers. So if you have a, if you're using microservices uh, running in many containers and other buzzwords, then you can be able to very easily start to trace the transactions across every hop of the network. So you can see uh, distributed transaction traces across complex microservices architectures. Whereas, and most of these tools will only show you the call graph from the first hop. Uh, these tools make it very easy to trace distributed transactions together so you can see one end-to-end -end view even though you're talking to 100 different application services underneath. So if you look at complex applications like Twitter, um, the other ones are like Netflix, you know, all of, like posting a tweet involves 100 services. Watching a Netflix video uh, involves 100 services. It's not just making a call to the Java tier to the Oracle database and giving you a video back, it's much more complex. So when you're trying to debug performance problems, how do you get visibility? So I would say all of these open source tools are very easy uh, because they're, they're easy in the sense that they're free. Um, they're hard in the sense that they require a lot of engineering effort. So you still have to be able to visualize them. You have to manually instrument the code. You have to glue together the responses to derive value. Uh, so these are great solutions if you have the engineering time to invest. Um, oftentimes it's, it's better to, it's easier to go with an APM solution. Okay, yeah, thank you. Let's thank um, Dustin again. Thank you very much.